이렇게 이렇게 Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to another one of the Let's Talk Astronomy sessions. So by now, you have all attended at least one session uh, uh, for, for the masters or for the bachelors or the, for the school students. So this is a little different from the last few sessions that we have conducted where we covered all of a lot of topics in astronomy. So here we have a special guest with us today, uh, uh, Professor H.S. Mani of the Chennai Mathematical Institute. So we will be delving a little deeper into the history and methods of one of the important topics in astronomy, which is distance measurement in astronomy. So about the uh, speaker, uh, I'll give a very brief intro. He uh, taught physics, taught at the uh, physics department in IIT Kanpur, and he's just retired from uh, HRI Allahabad. And he owns two reflecting telescopes, which he uses for outreach, but he complains that he doesn't take it out often enough. So uh, give a warm welcome to Professor H.S. Mani. And I'll just have to remind you again, you have done this a lot of times, uh, that if you want to ask questions, you can go to the YouTube disc uh, description below. And you can uh, you can uh, click on this link, which will take you to a question and answer form. Sorry, uh, questions and feedback form where you can ask any questions you want. So please feel free to uh, ask questions while the talk is going on. And after the session is over, we will have a forty-five minute Q and A session to answer all of your questions. So it's over to you, Professor Mani. Uh, can I start my video? Yes, yes, you can. Okay. Uh, am I coming out clearly? Is that enough? Yes. Or yes, yes, you are. Is it okay? Fine. You can see me completely. Yes. Fine. Uh, uh, just a minute. Maybe I'll just make it a notch a little better. Is this a little better? Yes, it's good. Okay, good. Now, firstly, I would like to thank the organizers for taking so much trouble and pain to ensure that my talk gets smooth. And if there is any problem, of course, it is really due to me. And the other person I want to thank is my friend, Anand Kurian, who has been helping him in a variety of ways, including organizing the talk and so on. Hopefully, uh, I'm able to do a better one than I originally planned. So. Let me start by uh, sharing the screen. And how do I do that here? I'm not able to see. Ah, there it is. OK. I will uh, start my file very soon. Why it's not clicking? Okay, I have to go there and do it. Oh, uh, just a second. Let me go to that. So, can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Okay, good. So, this is the introduction to measurements of distances in astronomy. And as you know, in the last uh, about, say, 20 years or so, this century, astronomy has become exploded and primarily because gravitational waves have been discovered. And there is a lot of very interesting work about understanding our universe is taking place. So enormous amount of very interesting research is going on and it will continue to go on for the next few decades as I see it. Now, the 
thing is, one of the important thing to know in astronomy is what is the shape of the universe. So to know that, you need to know distances. Notice by sitting here, I can only measure angles. I cannot measure distances from sitting on the earth unless you use some smart methods. I do not know whether the moon is nearer or the sun is nearer just by looking at it. Both are far. So this required a certain amount of thinking and ultimately a lot of interesting work has been done. And after a painstaking work for more than two centuries, the answer that has come out is that the universe is isotropic and homogeneous. This means that if I look at any direction and if I average over sufficient amount of region, any direction looks the same as any other direction. There is no particular direction in which this happens. To get to this result took a long time. The other assumption which astronomers make is that this space is homogeneous. That is, Instead of doing the observation from, say, the Earth, you go and go to the star Arcturus and do it, you will not, or go to another nebulae and do it, Andromeda nebulae, you find the answer should be the same. But that, of course, you cannot experimentally verify so directly. You, whenever you build a model, the model contains these two statements and the various observations which are there are compared with the predictions of the model. And till now, it has been holding true. So now, let me start by discussing the, uh, the simplest of cases. I will be using the unit of light year. All of you, I'm sure, know this. The light year is one light year is the distance light travels in a year. One year is 3.15 times 10 to the 7 seconds. Incidentally, a good mnemonic to remember that is pi times 10 to the 7 because pi is 3.14, it's pretty close enough. And c is 3 into 10 to the 8. So it works out to approximately 10 to the 16 meters. 9.5 times so much works to 10 to the 16 meters. The next thing I'm coming is to measure the radius of the Earth. This was done before the common era by an astronomer called Eratosthenes. The idea is this. Think of rays. Firstly, he modeled the Earth. He assumed it is spherical. This he had certain reasons to do. I will not get into that. Let us just assume the, uh, the fact that the assumption that the Earth is a, ray, a spherical object. Rays from the sun come from the right here. And they are directly coming here. Sun is very far away. So the rays are parallel. They are all coming. So at A, the, I have a rod which is pointing towards the sun here directly. It is vertical rod kept at A. Notice at this point, there will be no shadow because the rays are coming vertically down. On the other hand, let me go to a point like B. B, the vertical direction is BL. That is the one which will be the tangent to it is the way I am showing my arrow along BL1. And then it is BL is the direction of the shadow. And sorry, the direction of the rod. The rays, therefore, will not be coming directly overhead, but it will be slanted. And this angle that is there, angle LB to the sun, is what I will call theta. That can be measured because LB to the sun is the same angle as BL. L1. I will repeat it. The angle LB to the sun is the same as the angle BLL1. But then if, if I take that angle, tan theta is the length of the shadow divided by the length of the rod. So I can measure the length of the shadow. I know the length of the rod. So I know this angle theta. If I know the angle theta, I know this angle is theta because these are all parallel rays. So angle LB to the sun is the same as angle BCA. Angle BCA is this angle and LB sun is that angle. So once I know this angle, AB divided by theta in radians is the radius of the Earth. So what Eratosthenes did, he chose a place called sine at here where he had the sun come out here 
and Alexandria was the other place. And he measured the distance from here to here by moving in a horse cart. He marked the wheels of the horse cart and then counted the number of times the wheel turned. He knew this distance. He also knew this angle. Based on that, he could find out the radius of the Earth. And that was right within a few percent. So I have just here, I've, whatever I've said, I have read. I'll just wait for a couple of minutes to, for you people to see whatever I have said is written out here. Okay. The way the sun was supposed to be overhead at sign also was interesting. He had a deep well and he could see the shadow or the shadow of the sun in the or the mirror image of the sun in the deep well in the water. So he knew the sun was vertically up. So, all right. So let me move to the next one. This is the picture of Eratosthenes. Now I come to Kepler's laws. The idea that planets move around the sun and not the sun move around the earth was completely settled by Kepler. Kepler studied the motion of the planets and he came out with the three laws of planetary motion. All of us studied this in high school. The first law states that all planets move around the sun in an elliptical orbit with sun as the focus. This is the first law. And then we will see how Kepler actually came to this conclusion. And then he needed data and the data was made available to him by Tycho Brahe. Ty Kepler was Tycho Brahe's assistant. And there is a very interesting story associated with how Tycho, how Kepler got the Tycho Brahe data. Uh, the relationship between Tycho Brahe and Kepler were not the most pleasant ones, and but Kepler successfully got the data. And there was a lot of dispute from Tycho Brahe's family associated with it. There are many websites which discuss this in a very interesting way. But let's get back to the measurement and how Kepler got to the loss. We all know the Earth takes 365 days to complete one revolution around the sun. What does that mean? After 365 days, we see a motion of the sun. After 365 days, the sun comes to the same background of stars. So the first question that arises is that when the sun is there, you cannot see the stars. So how do we know that? The way they know it is they had studied the sky very thoroughly. They knew it cold. So when just before the sun rises, you see a bunch of stars. So those stars are west of the sun. And then when the sun sets, they see another bunch of stars just after setting near the sun. And they are to the east. So this way, they are able to sandwich the sun between the two stars and so on, they know where it is. Making these observations, they found out that the sun, the earth takes 300 or the sun takes 365 days to complete one revolution or the other way around as we know it today. So what will be the angular velocity? In one round, it takes two pi radians. So angular velocity is two pi divided by the time it takes. And I've written down the answer in days inverse, not in second inverse, but days inverse. I will keep that unit all along. Now come to Mars. He had a lot of data on Mars. And when we are looking at Mars, we are not seeing Mars from the point of view of Sun. We are seeing it from the point of view of Earth. So whatever we are measuring of Mars is relative to Earth. He knew that the Mars was took 779 days to complete one revolution as seen from the Earth. So that means that the angular velocity of Mars with respect to Earth is 2 pi divided by 779, which is equal to the angular velocity of the Earth minus the angular velocity of Mars. And it actually, I should write the magnitude, but angular velocity of the Earth is more than the angular velocity of Mars. So I just did not do that. Now, omega m is the angular velocity of the Mars around with respect to the sun. 
that is called tm and my other value is 779 days i know this i know omega e so i can calculate omega m so i calculate omega m or tm and when i do that 1 by tm i cancel the 2 pi up there and i write down 1 by tm is equal to 1 by 365 minus 1 by 779 it gives approximately 686 days so kepler found out that mars returns to the same position in the orbit around the sun in 686 days this conclusion was crucial and he exploited it very well i'll just wait again for a second just for people to digest what i have said notice there are angular velocity of the earth angular velocity of mars with respect to the earth which is omega e minus omega m given these two numbers i can calculate the angular velocity of mars and then i can calculate the time period and the time period works out to be 686 days okay let's see how we exploited it let's assume we are the way i have drawn it everything is clockwise all the motion i am thinking of it is clockwise here is the sun he had modeled the entire thing as earth and all other planets are going around the sun this was the model he used then he knew that suppose we have this configuration at a particular instant of time earth sun and behind the sun is mars and along that direction are distant stars now after 686 days mars will come back to the same position that's what we learned little earlier now what will the earth do earth will complete one in 365 and the second one in 730 days so there is still something so earth is somewhere here now he assumed some fixed distance sm as one he knew where the distant stars were so he could measure the angle of mars with respect to the same distant stars that were seen from e1 he could also see the sun so he could measure the angle s e2 m so what are the angles he knows now he knows angle s m e2 and angle s e2 m he knows these two angles therefore the third angle is automatically known the sum of them is 180 degrees so that's known and so and sm was fixed moment sm is fixed all three angles are known the triangle is completely fixed so he is able to locate the position e2 now repeat it again another 686 days he will come somewhere here and he will know this position this way he could go ahead and locate the position of the earth and get the orbit of the earth so this is what is explained in these slides i will go over it slowly mars comes back to the same position earth on the other hand would have completed one revolution and some more and it will and will be at e2 i made a mistake here we know the, from the observation angle s e1 m uh, what i have called e i should have called e1 and e2 if i want to make a corresponding to figure i'm sorry for this i thought i had corrected this okay uh, once this angle is known for the fix the length of mars in some units and draw the lines and then the earth's position is known from such repeated observations earth orbit was determined once the earth orbit is determined one can determine mars orbit in the reverse fashion now you can let take mars go to any other point and go back in 368 uh, 686 days but you know your orbit of the earth so you can use that to find out the position of the mars and he got the mars orbit after actually he found out the orbit of mars it took him another 4 years to show it is an ellipse he tried all sorts of figures but ultimately he converged on the ellipse and fortunately the eccentricity for mars is large enough and tycho brahe's data was accurate enough for this analysis this was the main thing that had happened okay that finishes one a uh, portion and now let me just give you a look, one second five seconds or 10 seconds to just mull over what i have said and we go to the next he did not yet know 
Kepler did not know the actual distances. He only knew the relative distances. Given a fixed SM, he knew the orbit of the Earth. Given that, he could find the orbit of Mars. So everything was relative to that fixed distance he had done. To actually find the distance took another more than 100 years. And that is the method of parallax. I'm sure most of you know this, but still a revision is what I'm trying to do. Method consists of measuring the angle subtended by an object from two different places. So here is the object O, and I am looking at it from two different places, PQ. These are distance points. So when I'm looking at it from P, the object O looks like it is somewhere in the direction of A. When I move to Q, the line QA and PA are parallel. But so it will be here. The object O is no longer in that direction, but some other direction. Let's say that direction is A prime. Now, this is the thing. A, A, this A prime QA, if you can measure this angle, then you know the angle POQ. You know the angle POQ and you know the distance PQ, then you can get the distance QO or PO or in between midpoint and O. Let me repeat. This angle theta, angle POQ is equal to angle OQC in a triangle. This is the external angle and then minus OPC. And so you can measure these two angles and having measured them, you find theta. When an observer views O from P, the background star is A. I'm just repeating what I had said. When O is viewed from Q, the background star is A, which uh, means the angle is A prime, A dashed, which it means, which makes an angle with A. And this is the parallax. The, notice the larger the distance base PQ, the larger the parallax. Also, further the object is here, the less the parallax, the angle will become less. So for a accurate measurement, you need a large base and you need very accurate angular measurements. Now let's find out the formula for distance. I am making a very simple picture. There's my P, Q, and I'm joining. This is the star for which I'm going to find, which I had called O. And this is a different diagram, so my things are different. And the midpoint here is O. Now, angle PSO is equal to angle O, QSO. These two angles are equal. This is the midpoint. And that will be equal to half the angle PSQ. Half the angle PSQ, which since the full angle is the parallax, theta by 2. So OS tan theta by 2 is PO, which is PQ by 2. Oh. So OS, which is the distance to the star, is PQ by 2. For small theta in radians, tan theta equal to theta to a very good approximation. In fact, using a calculator on one's mobile, one can easily, this can easily be verified. For example, take 5 degrees. 5 degrees is 5 times pi divided by 180, which is 0 0.087266 radians. And tan 5 degree is 0 0.087488. You compare these two. The first two digits are the same. And it's only on the, sorry, fourth place, there is a difference. So this is a good approximation. So theta is equal to 2 PO by OS, which is PQ by OS. So OS, the distance to the star, OS, the distance to the star, is given by PQ, the base, divided by the parallax that has been measured. So this is the method of parallax, which uses is used to find distances. So after Kepler had done his work, the, in 1672, Italian astronomers Cassini and Richter made use of simultaneous measurement of the planet Mars from Paris and French Guinea. This, along with the Kepler's analysis, gave the Earth sun distance, which is within a few percent of the modern value. This is the first clean measurement of the distance to the sun. And once this was established, 
the size of our solar system was known. That was around 17th century when these things were based fixed. Now, distance to nearby stars, that's the next thing in line. The maximum base one can have sitting on the Earth is twice the radius of the Earth orbiting around. This can be achieved by waiting for six months. The Earth goes around to the other side of the Sun and of the elliptical orbit. And so you have a base of about twice the distance from Earth to Sun. Earth to Sun distance is about 150 million kilometers. So the base is about 300 million kilometers. Since stars are light years away, light year is a thing which I've already said, the parallax you can calculate is of the order of seconds of arc. In 1838, that is 19th century, Bessel found the distance to the star Proxima Centauri and found the parallax was 0.77 arc seconds. This is defined as half the angle the star subsun when viewed to a time difference of a half year. The base used was the diameter of the Earth's orbit, which is 300 million kilometers, which is 3 to 10 to the 11 meters. 0.77 arc second is 0.77 divided by 1 by 60th for converting it to minutes and another 1 by 60 converting it degrees. So this is the amount of it in degrees. And now I have to convert that into radians, which is pi times 180, 180 radians. So which works to so much. And the distance to prop, this was the radius of the orbit, Earth's sun distance. I divide by this radians, then I get four times 10 to the sixth. I had mentioned, remember, the light year was 9.5 times 10 to the 15. And so this is 4.2 light years. Distance to nearby stars. After the observation of the parallax of a star Proxima Centauri, several other stars distances were found. They needed better telescopes. Herschel had a very good telescope and they needed to improve the resolving power. They needed to understand the atmospheric refraction. Several technical details were required to keep improving. This went on till the end of 19th century when distances to about 100 stars near light, uh, distances of about 100 light years was, came, was determined with some accuracy. It was not great accuracy within, let's say, 10%. Very important development was the accurate determination of the distance to Hyades cluster of stars. This forms the backbone of what is called the cosmic distance ladder. The way distances are done in astronomy is you ascertain some distances very well, as much as you can by various methods, and you're able to fix that. Based on that, other distances are done by studying the properties of stars whose distances you know and see assume similar properties exist for those stars like luminosity or time variation and things like that and determine distance there are several properties of the stars which you assume as is common if they are similar characteristics you use that to get determinant determine the distances and there is a cross check associated with it here this ladder is one of the important point in the cosmic distance ladder the distance to here is ladder is determined by Hubble Space Telescope to be accurately. The method is accurately 151 plus minus 0.9 light years. And the resolving power of the Hubble Space Telescope is 10 to the minus 2 arc second. The method used was something called the proper motion of stars and also the fact that here this cluster was formed and all the stars have the same velocity. If they have the same velocity, it'll they will go and converge in some particular point. And that is, is something which requires much more discussion. And perhaps I should, I will not be able to do this in this lecture because I have to say something more interesting, I think, of more modern development. But this is an important point. And ultimately, this was determined. And the method itself is a very interesting method. There is something to learn there.
about something called the conversion point. Now I'll come to the last topic, that is the distance to supernova 1987A. You must you've already seen lectures in which supernova is uh, comes because of the end life of a star, and at some stage there are some stars which collapse, emitting a large amount of energy, and that much more than the energy is emitted by a sun. It is so bright it can be as bright as a galaxy for a short while, and this then further decays down. On 23rd February 1987 such a supernova exploded, which was visible. And this was great discovery for particle physics. I'm a, I worked in particle physics, and mainly because the neutrinos emitted from there, which was theoretically predicted, were discovered on the Earth. So neutrinos coming from the sun had already been seen, but this is the first time that an object other than the sun whose neutrinos were made seen. And a lot of interesting conclusions came from there. So this was done. Then how was the distance to supernova determined? It turns out the supernova had a circular ring around it. It was something like a circular ring of a gas. Now, what happened was the supernova, when it exploded, a lot of gamma rays were emitted and these gamma rays hit the ring. When they hit the ring, the ring, atoms in the ring got excited and they started radiating. And that radiation was also received in the Earth. So let me explain how the whole thing looks in using. Oh, can I now stop sharing? Yes, if you want. Yeah, I do. Now I will show you this. Assume this is the supernova. OK, can you see? Yes. Right. Uh, I hope the letters are not mirror uh, reversed. Is it OK? It looks OK. All right. The center here is where the supernova is. And if the ring were like this, all of this, all the entire ring would be sub coming at the same distance to us. But the ring was not like that. The ring was like this. Then notice this looks to you like an ellipse now. But this point here is nearer to us than the backward point here. So the light from here came to us before the light from there. That difference in time was known. The light coming from here to the light coming from here, from observation, the distance was known. And that distance was not, not a small distance. That was 400 days much more than the time taken for light to reach from Earth to Sun, which is eight minutes. So this is more than one light year. And that distance, the Hubble Space Telescope measured the angular separation. Given the angular separation, they could do it. Notice, if the ring had been like this, flat, we would not have been able to see it. If the ring had been like this, the entire ring would have been lit at the same time. And there is no way of knowing what had happened. Fortunately, the ring was like that. So you knew the time in which it, this became bright, and you know the time in which this became bright, and so you could find out the difference. And once you knew the difference, you knew certain lengths, because that 400 days into the time traveled by light, that is C into 3 into 10 to the 8, you knew the distance of from the back to the front. And using the angle in which this ring is uh, tilted, they could calculate everything. I will just show you the calculation in a minute. So this is the basic idea. The ring was lit. The front end got lit first. The back end got lit later. The difference time essentially determines the dimensions of this ring. And the angular diameter could be measured by the Hubble Space Telescope. And that fixed the distance. So let me go back and share. Okay, here is the ring. Here is the Andromeda 
and that is large Magellanic cloud. Again, I am showing the ring taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. The inner ring is what we are talking about. Okay, before I do the uh, the math, I want, want to show you one more thing, which is here. I will just this is a supernova. You can see the ring is being lit. Being a little more. Let me just broaden this so that you can see it better. Okay. And after 400 days, the 400 is not coming out well. Let's see whether it, oh, it went back. Ah, here you can see. After 400 days, the entire ring was lit. This was what was seen. And the, now the ring is slowly disappearing. The intensity is because they, they have started decaying. All this had to be studied to ascertain the nature of the excitation, the nature of the gas here, and so on. They will take us to some other place. So I will now go back to my June 4th slide. OK. are done. Ah, here it is. So uh, notice the PQRS which I had marked. Uh, the, this is the slanted ring. This is RP, the diameter of the ring. And this is the slanted one. And I have shown the side view. Q, the point is here. S is here. This is to the observer. This is the portion which gets lit first. This is the one which get lost. So this is the distance for which the light has to travel. That is the distance AS. And if D is the diameter of the ring, and if this angle is theta, notice this angle is 90 minus theta, and then angle QSA is 90 minus theta, and AQS is theta. So D sine theta is AS. And how do I know theta? I know theta because I can measure this distance and I can also measure that distance. So I know this divided by that and that's nothing but cos theta. So I know theta because I know this angular distance and this angular distance, so I know theta. I know AS, AS is 400 times C, the velocity of light. I know theta, so I know D. And having measured the D, I use the Hubble telescope to get the angular distance and D divided by that delta angle is the answer to the distance to the supernova. Okay, side view, cos theta, CT. I've just said the same thing again. Is time is T, D sine theta by C, CD is D sine theta, and QA is D cos theta. So CT is QA by tan theta, which is D cos theta. Sine theta. Knowing T and theta, we know D. And having known D, the Hubble Space Telescope tells what is the angular diameter of the ring. The angular diameter of the ring works out to so many arc seconds. And that is so many radians. Okay, so this is the basic idea. For the inclination, theta was 43.5 degrees, and the time taken was 400 days, I've already told you. So AS, I've calculated the distance. So D is this, divide, this distance divided by the angle into, of course, that led to the theta, this is the distance. So distance from the Earth is this answer that I have here, and I divide that 
the, the angular distance measured by angular separation measured by the Hubble Space Telescope. And this is the diameter of the ring. And that answer works out to be. I can convert them into light years. And the light year answer is this. A much more sophisticated analysis, putting in various chi square tests and so on, Panakia has obtained the answer as 166.9. Notice the error is still a few, uh, close to 10% or little less, but that's the way it goes. This is a very important component in cosmic distance ladder. That completes what I wanted to say, and it looks like I did complete it in 45 minutes. Thanks a lot. And I have my contact information here. Thank you. Okay, so if you people have questions, Hi. Uh, so, uh, do you want to continue with the hiatus uh, cluster, the distance part? No, that uh, I have to pull up the slides. It may take a little okay. longer. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, so, Shubham, yeah, you can uh, put the questions in the uh, Zoom chat. And, sir, uh, if you open Zoom chat, you can. See... I open Zoom chat. Yeah, you can see the questions which are yeah. coming in. Right. All right. So uh, if there's you, a if, question by Nishkal. What yes. advantages does neutrino wave, neutrino wave astronomy have? How can one measure vary distance using that technique? No, neutrinos does not tell us distances. What it was able to do was study the, there was the neutrinos arrived more or less at the same time light. So if the difference, the mass of neutrino is a very big issue. And the other issue is neutrino comes not in one flavor, but in three flavors. The way the flavors come out in various different, uh, for example, the sun emits primarily uh, neutrinos, whereas uh, supernova can emit neutrino of the electron kind, muon kind, and tau meson kind. It is the study of those which are there and not used for distances uh, for measuring. And uh, this has been going on for a long time. And many things have been done recently. But in terms of neutrino astronomy, it, the number of events that has been seen is just not as good as for the solar astronomy, where the mixing angles associated with neutrino E becoming, uh, converting itself into neutrino mu and so on has been fixed very well. But that's not from the neutrino, as, as, not from the supernova. Okay. I did not understand how angles are equal. Okay. I didn't quite understand the question. Let me just go back to the slide. I'm trying to answer the question of Anjali. All right. And uh, let me see uh, if I let me. That just is going to be uh, Earth's radius measurement. Huh? That is for the measurement of the radius of the Earth. Okay. So that, I understand that, but uh, well, understand the angles, are, how the angles are equal. Okay, I'll just go there. Notice, these are parallel rays coming. So this angle, this is a parallel ray. These two rays are parallel. And I join this line. So angle BAC is the angle LBC. So I hope that answers the question. This two angles are equal. And how do I measure this angle? Again, I use the fact that rays coming from the sun are parallel. Angle LB to the sun is the same as angle BLL1 here. But I can measure this angle. That tan, this angle is L1B divided by BL. I know the length of the shadow. I know length of the rod. So I know tan of this angle. Given the tan of the angle, I know the angle. So this angle is this, because these are all parallel rays. So this angle is equal to this angle. And these are corresponding angles. I hope that answers the question. OK. Uh, sir, uh, when you uh, 
when you read the questions can you just repeat the question for the sake of the audience oh, sure sure yeah, i will thank do that. you uh, can the question be repeated for the tube viewer that's what i said anirudh while using the earth as a base for the parallax method how do you account for the earth's curvature i didn't quite understand this the point is any point on the earth the distance would be something difference would be a few thousand kilometers whereas when i am going six this months later it is 300 million kilometers so the kind of errors that are there are not large but they can be taken into account by doing appropriate trigonometry and mathematics but if you mean by the curvature of the earth the distance of measurement from there to there uh, 1000 kilometers which is the order of the distance of the earth is much smaller than the million kilometers that is used as a base or 300 million kilometers that is used as a base whereas the errors are much more due to the parallax angles measurement the uh, resolving power of telescopes are not that great okay i mean can the questions be read out by someone before sir okay can someone read the i assume what is triangulation how is it useful to measure distances this is something which we learn in high school right if i want to measure a distance to a height of a building or a height of a tower i firstly stand at a place and then i measure the angle of the tip of the tower then i move at a certain distance d and then i again measure the angle i move towards the tower the angle increases so i can measure that angle i know the distance i have moved i know the two angles so i can complete the triangle i know the side and i know the two angles the included side two angles and the included side so if i know the triangle i know completely the property of the triangle i know where the tip is so i know the height it's all scale down of course when you draw it in a paper you're not going to draw the whole thing you will scale it down and then appropriately scale it up okay how to determine the diameter of galaxies and their distance oh uh, firstly distance to galaxies various methods are used one of the most prominent method used was using variable stars there are certain cepheid variables whose time period tells us the luminosity of the star given a certain time period the luminosity of the star how is it known i had mentioned that 100 light years people had measured it using parallax and here this cluster was also measured so you look for stars which are variable stars and study the properties of the variable stars and then you find the variation has certain relation to luminosity you assume that when i see a star very far away whose distance i do not know i assume the same law holds how do i know it is true i don't i need some other property some other thing to check this is what goes on in astronomy all the time they need different properties like there is something called a standard ruler in which you locate a object called red giant and you know that what is the length the diameter of a certain property of red giant and that is supposed to be the same for all red giants of that property once i know that length if i can measure the angular separation i know the distance so you use many variety of methods to to get to the distance to galaxies oh the ring which has surrounded the supernova the understanding is not very good incidentally all these things are in terms of some files of various uh, documents i have forwarded them to the organizers those of you who are interested can look at them and there are simple exercises in that to help you determine the yeah, orbit the kepler has drawn in fact using old data of kepler itself there are articles i have forwarded them and those of you who are interested can certainly take it from them and use it as an exercise similarly for the supernova the same kind and there itself it is made clear that the ring nobody knows where the ring came from some dying according to some uh, speculation some dying star was there it emitted and it went as a ring 
down not very clear okay how to measure distances if ring in supernova was not tilted no then no no hubble's this is far too near for discussions thing like hubble constant uh, to go to hubble constant you have to go much farther these are all distances much nearer okay how to measure distances to the ring no how can we measure uh, distance sir, to black uh, can holes? you repeat the, the question there are many black uh, holes all over the place incidentally there is a very beautiful talk given in in uh, center of uh, uh, bangalore center for theoretical sciences i think and this is a, a professor from yale i forget her name uh, it's a south indian name do you remember any of the organizers yeah priyam vardhan natarajan you want to yeah priyam vardhan natarajan please see that she discusses black holes very well there is a very massive black hole in the center of our galaxy so we know the distance to black hole is not anything more different than other things uh, other uh, stellar objects so uh, if it is the middle of our galaxy we know our galaxy quite well so you know where it is but if the black hole is somewhere else you know the distance to galaxy by using some other methods and that will determine the uh, galaxy that's right then comes yukta while finding time period of mars how was retro no that is not necessary at all in the argument i gave you of course retrograde motion will occur at times but the main point is after he noticed that the period of mars after 699 days or something came back to the same position whether it was retrograde or that it is irrelevant that's retrograde is only associated with the fact that earth is moving and the mars is moving that is automatically taken into account Ah, uh, sir, can you repeat the question? Uh, whenever oh, you. Oh, yeah. uh, sorry. Again, no I problem. forget. Thank you. Uh, oh, the question was, where was it? Uh, while finding time period of Mars, how was the retrograde motion accounted for? Notice the argument never needed to know whether omega e m was positive or negative. If it is positive, I have just assumed it to be positive, so both sides I keep it positive. Okay, while finding time period, oh, that was done. Pravash, uh, what is cosmic distance ladder? Well, it's a word coined to understand that you assume distances of a lower order to be well fixed, and the next ladder is based upon the assumption that here this is at such and such 151 light years away, okay, or 151 light years away. That assumption is made to go to the next ladder, and you fix the distance to the next ladder. That is. like andromeda galaxy then after that you go even further you assume the andromeda galaxy is so much based on that you go and find out other distances this is what is called the cosmic distance ladder uh, some of you if you are interested should read the book of weinberg the first 3 minutes incidentally i was always interested in observational astronomy when i was young my father Uh, showed me various stars it was great fun but my major interest in communicating came after reading this book the first 3 minutes ah next is what is called can einstein theory of relativity be used to calculate distances you have doppler shift but doppler shift does not tell you the distance it only tells you the radial velocity of that incidentally that is that part of information is used in understanding here this cluster but the doppler shift happens whether there is special theory of relativity or not it's a correction and if these velocities are not that of light close to light you don't need to need it to the accuracy that we are talking about so in general uh, uh, einstein's theory of relativity can, uh, can be used to calculate it. oh wait a minute if you are talking about the general theory of relativity there are 
different kinds of distances that are discussed there. One is called the luminosity distance. That is, if I have an object of a certain luminosity, and if I take it further away, then the luminosity should decrease by 1 by d squared if it were obeying Euclidean geometry. Similarly, if I look at the angle subtended, when I take it away, the angle should decrease as 1 by d if I do Euclidean geometry. But if I assume the space is curved, the game is different. So you have to do a calculation all over again. And that is one of the standard exercises one does when one learns general relativity. There are therefore different distances there. One is called the luminosity distance, which is what is commonly used. Okay. Next is mode. What is the difference between isotropy and homogeneity? Okay. I can be sitting at the center of a sphere. To me, every point there looks the same. That is isotropic. But moment I go to the edge of the sphere, and not only isotropy is gone, the, there is no homogeneity because outside the sphere there is something else. So isotropy is associated with direction. Homogeneity is associated with translatory motion. So if I go from one point A to another point B, if everything looks the same, like the, take the surface of a sphere, the surface of a sphere is both isotropic and homogeneous. You take a point, any direction you go, it looks the same. Take any other point, any other point looks the same as this point. There is nothing special about any particular point on a sphere. That has both isotropy and homogeneity. I hope that answers the question. Okay. Does gravitational wave astronomy provide instant to this? Yes. The answer is yes. It does. But it's a rather a complicated calculation. People have done that. Essentially, measuring the intensity and then find they know the it is a black holes which are going through. So they know the masses and they know how much energy is coming there is getting emitted and you know how much energy you are receiving here and that difference is what gives. It. So to everyone in the audience, please continue to ask questions. Uh, OK. So there Next is one question. more question. Yeah. How is the diameter of the moon measured? OK. Uh, there are several different methods used. In fact, it was used by uh, people studying lunar eclipses. They know the duration of the lunar eclipse. They know what kind of angles are involved. And the time period associated with the lunar eclipse can be used to measure the diameter. But from whatever talk I have done, let us see what it is. I have told you the Earth's sun distance. I know what is the angle subtended by the sun's diameter. And so I know the Earth's sun distance. I know the moon also. Wait a minute. That may not help here. No, sorry. Uh, that has to be done another separate measurement. This will not help. No, you have to do a full other measurement and using eclipses, it can be done. Of course, these days, what they do is they have sent radar beam and get a reflection. And so they find out the distance. That's how it is found today. But using some triangulation or using parallax again, go to two different points of the Earth and see the distance of, of some particular point on the moon, you will be able to locate the distance to the moon. That has also been done. I don't remember the details. Okay. How did our position in, well, how did we find our position in the Milky Way? Okay. Uh, this is a very nice exercise, which uh, is done in Delhi Planetarium. You, what you do is you count the number of stars. All the stars you see are in our galaxy. And especially if you concentrate around the Milky Way and you count the number of stars going. So if you count, you will be able to see that uh, if you go in a certain direction, the number of stars decreases. That shows where how far you are from. Uh, if you are at the complete edge, you will not see any star there. 
So it depends. That's one, one clue that you get. And the second one is that you also see when the stars are going, uh, there is something called the proper motion of stars. That is, if you go over a period of time, like few years, few decades, the position of the star changes because they all move. Given a cluster, you can find out how far they have moved. And then by, again, measuring the parallax, you find the distances. And after putting up all that together, all this counting as well as this, the shape and the position of planets are done. It's a very detailed work, like what the, mm, uh, the people who do making maps of the world, though they have to take, they have to make measurements at various angles. Similarly, it is done here. This is more complicated because your data is all from the Earth. It's not a, I cannot answer this question in one shot. It is a long winded process. That's why we shake. What is parsec? Okay. Uh, supposing I have a star at some distance so that the angle subtended by the earth sun distance that is 150 miles to be one arc second. Okay. I will repeat it. The distance, supposing a star is at a certain distance D, the angle the star sees of the radius of the earth sun orbit the sun is earth is going around the sun and that orbit radius is 150 million kilometers and if the star sees that as one arc second that is one parsec and you can do the calculation and you will see one parsec is about 3.26 light years this is another unit used I did not want to clutter at this thing with too many units. That's why I stuck to light years. One parsec is, uh, that is by uh, Prabhash. Okay. Could you please suggest further reading material for a master student in astronomy? One of the best books I have read is SHU, S-H-U. It contains a lot of very good physics and it explains many, many interesting problems. That's one of the best books I like at that level. There may be more modern books. This is 1990s. I'm sure uh, the organizers may have better suggestions than mine. But this certainly is a very good book. True. I use it all the time. There is also one by Arnab Rai Chaudhary. Uh, uh, he has written a book. On a, uh, that's also a good book for undergraduate book, but it's uh, quite detailed. And so it can be used for master's program also. Arnab Rai Chaudhary. And there are some very extensive books. I forget the name. Maybe just Costel and somebody know. Do any of you remember? I have a copy of it somewhere. Can parallax method be used to distance of exoplanets? Uh, but can you repeat the question? Uh, I will repeat the question. Uh, it is again by Akash. Can parallax methods be used to measure distance to exoplanets? I'm not sure. I don't know enough data to know, but it looks like it should be possible, but I'm not sure. If one of you know the answer, please do tell me. I would also like to know. Can you tell us about other crucial measurements that were made, which required only high school mathematics? One was the distance to moon using solar uh, lunar eclipse. And uh, other was the Hyades cluster, which required one more point, which I had mentioned. And but that can be understood at the high school level. It's fun. It's quite nice. 
and then I do not know of any other. Maybe there are, but I, I am not familiar with them. Oh, there is one very nice one which was uh, done by Joseph Prabhakar. I will also show you. How to measure distances in the heights of in moon. This was done apparently by Galileo. And again, the idea was this. You know, as the moon, the, uh, the sun's, uh, uh, moon's faces happen because of the reflection of the sun. So if you look at it very carefully, the moon, the dark side, you will see sometimes a white spot. And Galileo concluded that white spot is because there was a peak in the, on that side of the moon which was still being lit by the sun and the rest of it was lower, so it was not being lit. So based on that, you could find the height of the mountain in the moon. There is a very nice talk. It is in Tamil though by Joseph Prabhakar and uh, um, you, he could be requested to give the, the beautiful talk and uh, he has sent me the references. Okay, Namaneet Anand. What happens to stellar objects inside a galaxy when the universe is expanding? Do the distance between stellar objects also increase? This is a, see, the, the exact answer to this question depends upon a little bit of more detailed um, math, mathematics. Now, how do you, if you talk about any object, in principle, there is, random motion there is various kinds and if you average over all that there will be a uniform motion away from us of various forms that's all there is no simple answer to this question it will be completely uh, 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 the, uh, the completely washed out by the random motion that is there which is far more inside a galaxy the distances are too small too many Anand, could you elaborate on the significance measurements in the history of astronomy and how it helped? No, this I didn't understand. In the history of astronomy, oh, supernovae was helpful as I mentioned to you because we understood some things about neutrinos. Then a measurement in the history of astronomy, okay, and how it help us, how will it help? Oh, more and more supernovae, especially if it happens in our galaxy, we will collect enormous amount of neutrinos and that will certainly be a very big thing for astronomers. These energies of these neutrinos will be larger than the ones coming from the sun, usually 20 MeV, whereas most of the energy that comes from the sun is less than 6 MeV or so. So we will understand many interesting properties, perhaps also something associated with the CP violating parameter in the mixing mixing angles it's some property of the neutrino which people will understand okay deepthi narasimhan how was the distance between stars determined and uh, determined all determined at first how did oh the first one i had already mentioned uh, this is by uh, deepthi narasimhan how was the distance between stars and all determined at first how did variable suffice help now Bessel was the first one to measure, and by the end of 19th century, 100 stars measurements were all done by parallax. All of them were done only by parallax. The distances of Cepheid variable was used in the 1910 and 20 to fix the distance to some Cepheid variables which were in the Andromeda galaxy. There was a big debate going on whether the Andromeda galaxy, the entire material was within our galaxy or outside. After using the property of a Cepheid variable, they concluded firmly that Andromeda galaxy is not part of the Milky Way. This was the first big thing that happened. This is how Cepheid variable helped. Once they knew there were many other galaxies, galaxies were studied, Cepheid variable again was used, and Cepheid variables had Again, the properties of Cepheid variables when analyzed, there were two kinds of Cepheid variables, Cepheid variable one and Cepheid variable two. And there were something called RR Lyrae, which were also variable stars. So again, these properties were used in determining where 
the star where galaxies were and how different galaxies it's a long story of which i know very marginal amount and unless you are a specialist in this it is difficult to keep track of it arpita saha how is the diameter of the visible universe determined okay this the only way i know is you have to go back to study the evolution of the universe the universe has taken its uh, how many billion years old then approximately 13 point some billion years old and yeah, assuming the velocity of light so that will be the diameter of the universe so it is based upon the knowledge we have about the evolution of the universe and when you have to trace it back and see where it takes us that's the way i know maybe there are smarter methods which i am not familiar with uh, chandra mo kumar sahu how did the early astronomers measure small angles and precision of arc seconds experimentally using that instruments what instruments okay tycho brahe did not have a telescope in fact if you look at the way he measured angles and he had constructed different kinds of instruments is fantastic ingenuity he tried to reduce the errors quite a bit but even then his errors were of the order of arc seconds kepler when he was analyzing the orbit of mars and found out the orbit of mars to be an ellipse it took him a long time he did a lot of calculations different ones so he tried oval there is a shape oval and when he actually worked with an oval and found out the place of mars was wrong by about half a minute or so compared to the observation compared to his theoretical calculation of oval he writes tycho brahe could not have made that mistake so oval cannot be the orbit so he had so much confidence in tycho brahe's answer the the method the question was before telescope Tycho Brahe was the, the person who could minimize the errors of angular observation by a variety of tricks. This has been documented very well, and it takes a lot of effort to follow that. I have never followed it in great detail. I have looked at some portions and just marveled at the energy. Okay, then early astronomers, small angles using and Tycho Brahe's instruments. By the way, in India also in Jantar Mantar we have Jantar Mantar in Jaipur. We have Jantar Mantar in Delhi. Our idea was to use larger and larger distances to decrease the angle errors in angle, and this to some extent worked. But the telescope, even the smallest telescope we have, gives much better accuracy. Unfortunately, our um, uh, uh, the rulers did not pay enough attention. They knew of the existence of a telescope. They did not pay enough attention to the use of telescope at that time. had they there were many bright people who they would have used it to to uh, take advantage of understanding the universe at that time this did not happen how did the earliest on measures have seen jagrit goel how can how can we measure the distance of black holes from earth no you uh, directly black hole you will have to see some objects nearby the black hole which are either emitting out light because something is being absorbed and by the black hole and then that is emitting light as it is getting accelerated towards the black hole and then study the properties of light it is by studying the neighboring uh, neighbors that you get an idea of the black hole maybe there are other methods too which i am not aware of does rotation of planets not affect the measurement the, you mean to say the rotation about their own axis not a not a big deal okay now we come to the end of the q and a session uh, so that's for, so thank you for giving such a wonderful lecture sir and for answering all the questions from the, that the students have posted so i'll just share my concluding screen yes
so as you all know uh, you can write to us at askastronomer at gmail.com and you can see in the poster that uh, professor mani's email address is also written and uh, don't worry if you missed some parts of the video or so so after this live session has ended you can go back to the same url and you can uh, see the video again and as professor mani said all the material that he presented we have added the link to download that in the youtube description so please go ahead and download it work it all out see the video again ask us more questions we want to keep talking with you thank you again for attending this session i'll see you later bye bye Okay. So yeah. Agra.